trying to get somebody to switch their mindset from pop music in Asia to pop music from Australia or pop music from Canada is very different. And so half of the battle is just trying to figure out, okay, I like elements of this, but I don't want it to sound too K-pop or J-pop or anything like that. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Off The Daw. Today I'm joined by Isla Noir. So welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Of course. How is everything on your end tonight? It's it's really good. I mean, I don't have a hurricane on the way, so I think I'm doing a little better than you right <laughs> now, Josh. But, <laughs> but other than that, I'm Probably. good. <laughs> well, you have like a, a heat wave or something, don't you? We do, although uh, please Canadians don't hate me. I'm from Australia and um, this heat wave to me is just like the beginning of summer, not actual summer. <laughs> right. So uh, I wanted to sort of dive in and just sort of talk about um, how you got started uh, with music in the beginning and, and what led you to uh, take it more seriously down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I, I got started, I guess, from when I was super young. My parents are both musicians. They played in a band, so I didn't really have any choice in the matter, which is great. <laughs> no complaints there. Um, but from there, I kind of, I would play with my parents, sing with them all the time. I did a lot of gigging as a young child and a teenager. Uh, and then my career kind of segued. I actually... Um, took a little bit of time off music and I was scouted as a model and I actually had a really successful modeling career as an international commercial model. Wow. Um, not, not your supermodel, not, not a household name, but if you look at your, um, like, you know, standard cereal boxes and stuff like that, that was me advertising, advertising those things to you. So that was kind of my career before, like in between music before and after. Like, did you do voice work on commercials too? or No. So usually, so I actually did a predominant amount of work in Asia. So they would get an Asian voiceover person to do it in whichever language of whichever country I was in. Um, so never my own voice. I guess they just don't like the Aussie accent. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of, all right. So you did, I, I'm actually really curious about this. So you did, <laughs> so what kind of, what other stuff did you uh, do for it? Um, oh, I've done so many things. I did a lot of condominium ads. So all the uh, the wife, the fake wife and the fake children. I don't have any children of my own, but I've had so many fake children and so many fake husbands. Um, <laughs> I What else have I done? A couple of car commercials. I, I did a hair commercial where they put in fake hair. So it wasn't even my real hair. Yeah. <laughs> That's the nature of the job. Right. What did that... <laughs> did you know that you were going to take that route and like what did that what was that like your first shoot or your first uh gig so so i definitely didn't think that was the the route i was going to take i actually um i started traveling when i was 17 and i was enrolled to go to university and my my whole dream was okay i'm gonna go to university study and do my music on like half half not on the side just split it evenly and then modeling took me overseas and I couldn't really lug my piano around I hadn't learned guitar yet so I kind of just focused all into the modeling it was great I mean you make some good money you make even better friends you get to travel the world um there are some crazy times there are some bad times but there are a lot more great times than bad times so it was pretty good and then towards the end of my Asia stint living in Asia I ended up starting back gigging again. I'd learned guitar by that point. Um, and I was playing in some of the clubs I played in. There's a club called FTV, Fashion TV. Um, very, very apt. It blended both of my loves together. So Fashion TV, all the models would go to this club and then I would sing at this club as well. So it was quite cool getting that kind of at the end of my modeling career. That is sick. Okay. How did you, uh, how did you learn guitar? Guitar, I honestly self-taught and I learned off a lot of, um, all the Brazilians for some reason seem to know how to play guitar. It's one of those innate things. They know how to play soccer and guitar. And so I learned, I didn't learn soccer, but I learned guitar. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. so, so at the end of, do you still do modeling now? 
very occasionally, yeah. not as much. I'm a little bit older now and I'm, I tend to do more things music related than modeling related, but Hey, if people want to book me for work, I'll do it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So you've been doing uh, music for a while. So how has, has there been like a change in the kind of music you either listen to or made back then differ from how uh, maybe you do now? Oh, definitely. It's so funny you ask this, Josh. Um, I was actually listening to a couple of old tracks that I did when I was, I think, 14 or 15. And the production on them is so good. And it wasn't me, so I can't claim any of that. I, I think I went to a, a local production house in Melbourne where I lived and th this guy did all the work and it was incredible. But I listened to the lyrics and the content of what I was singing and I was like, oh, that's the 14-year-old. That's <laughs> so different to what I sing today. Um, a lot of what I write today is a lot of the experiences that I've had from traveling. Obviously I'm living extremely far away from home. So I do write a lot about family, friends, um, heartbreak as everybody does. Of um, course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but um, now I think I'm focusing a lot of my time on production. I, I got into that, I'd say about 10 years ago when I was producing my first EP in Melbourne with a um, with two guys from Press Record Studios. And we just spend, it was amazing, we'd spend like 12 hours a day sitting in the studio, just playing around with everything that there was. And they, they're they sound engineers, so they know what they're doing, but I had no idea, but I'd be like, but what about this? And what about this? And slowly and slowly, like each time they would teach me a different thing with um, Ableton, which is the door that they were using. and from then on, I think I just got the bug. I'm hooked. I loved it. I've been writing, producing my own stuff, getting outside help, but also um, doing my own thing. And then this year, I'm hoping, hopefully, um, to get my album out, which has been completely written, produced by me. And wow. just, uh, I'll get it mixed and mastered by someone else. But yeah, it's been a long and fun journey. Not that, finished yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think was the, or maybe still is, what, what was the hardest part about learning to do the production side of, of music? Oh, I mean, there are so many hard things about the production side. Yeah. I, I think the hardest thing is when you're starting out, just getting the sound that's in your head out onto paper, so to speak, getting it out onto the screen, um, finding that, perf like, that perfect sound. And sometimes... I don't know if you do the same, but I find it so easy to get hung up on finding that exact sound that you're hearing in your head mm -hmm. when in reality, you should just be getting out whatever sound there is. And if it's close enough, if there's a chime, a bell, just put it down and come back to it later because getting the actual idea out is the hardest thing. And once you've got that down, things change all the time. And sometimes that bell that you thought was so important doesn't end up in the final mix. So sometimes it's just getting the entire idea out before getting down to the nitty gritty. I totally agree. And I used to be the same way. Like, like you said, there'd be something in my head and like, I need that sound. But actually it was honestly the uh, monthly course that I did that kind of like took me away from that, you know, cause it's like, you can have the best, you know, you can f dial in that perfect sound, but if you don't have like the arrangement, like what do you yeah. actually want the song to say? Like it's got to tell a story. And so if you're worried about dig dialing in some like, oh, the synth has to sound exactly like this, you kind of lose the, the big picture. Um, yeah, and I, totally. I, yeah, th I think that's been uh, immensely helpful for me as well, just from a like efficiency standpoint and, and getting songs written. Yeah, it's, it's almost like writing a perfect line of a poem, but not completing the poem. So yeah. then what's the point? <laughs> right. What's your, uh, I'm personally curious about this because this is something I've been working on a lot lately, is what's your uh, lyric writing process, if you have one? Oh, um, I tend to, I tend to write the melody first and then the lyrics follow whatever the melody is feeling. Um, I don't know if you're the same, but I, I tend to listen to what the melody or what the tone of the song is saying before I write any lyrics. Um, and then I did find the same thing with the monthly course. I did find that I do something similar to Ryan where you just sing rubbish and it comes out, but then there's little lines that you pick out and you're like, Oh, okay. This is what the song's saying. And it's just a subconscious almost streaming that comes out. 
when you're just recording whatever the melody is. Um, but from there, lyrics have, have been a big struggle for me. Um, I don't know why, but maybe it's the perfectionist inside of me and every other musician out there. But I'll write down these lyrics and I'll be like, this is great, and come back to it and I'll be like, this is awful. And I'll change them a hundred times before that final edit. And even when I listen to some of my songs, I was like, oh, if I could have just changed that one lyric around. But you know what? I think it's learning to let go. That's one of the most important things that anybody has ever told me. Just let go. Once it's out there, it's done. Even if you're 90% there, one lyric change isn't going to change the entire song and make it the best song in the world. If it's, you know, just like you got to let it go and if the song is where it needs to be, it's, it's going to be good. Yeah, I hear you. I'll be honest, like when uh, when we did Drive All Night and I was yeah. writing the lyrics to that, um, even even now there's part of my lyrics where I'm like, mm, I feel like I could have worded something a little no. bit. <laughs> I feel like I could have worded something a little bit differently. But, yeah. I, you know, it's like I could spend weeks trying to figure out a replacement, but my my rule that uh, I sort of kind of implement is that if I can't think of a concrete thing in like 24 to 48 hours, it's like, okay, that's that's what yeah. we're that's what we're sticking with. It may not be like perfect and what I totally want, but it it at least fits and and it makes sense. So that's what I've been sticking with. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's the best thing for your sanity as well. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um and quick plug for those who haven't listened to it yet. Get on it. <laughs> it's a really good. It's song. a great song, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh how did you this is kind of unrelated. How did you um what took you to Canada? Uh my husband, oh, my now okay. husband. At the yeah. time he was not uh my husband. I met him in Singapore and I've been traveling and I, I know that Australia is always there. It's a great country, but for me, I just want to keep exploring. And at the time he was like, well, I'm going to go back to Canada. What do you want to do? I was like, I'll come visit. And, uh, six and a half years later, I now live here. So <laughs> that changed very quickly. Um, I don't know if I'll stay here forever but I do really like it. It's a beautiful country. It's got so much to explore, although it's a little bit cold for me, even yeah. though we're in the middle of the heat wave right now. Right. What what city is it? Vancouver or where are you? I'm in at? Vancouver, the yeah, most okay. temperate part of, of Canada. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you, okay, this will be kind of interesting. So you've kind of, uh, had different experiences in multiple, you know, parts of the world, basically. So have you found that there's like differences in either the way uh, people make music or approach music in different parts, you know, whether it be Australia, Asia, Canada, have you noticed yeah. anything like that? Definitely. Um, definitely both within the business of music itself and the production of music. I think, um, Melbourne, and I only have my experiences working with this, this one group in Melbourne, but it was amazing. It's just very free and kind of uh, almost hippie in a sense, not, not in the sense of like burning sage or anything like that, but very <laughs> right. like hippie, like we'd light a candle and we'd sit in a dark room and <laughs> it was super cool, but we would kind of just muck around with a bunch of different instruments. And if something wasn't working, we'd all just get up and rotate and get onto a different instrument and play that. Whereas I find here, and maybe it's just the group of people that I'm hanging out with, but here in Canada, it's a little bit more methodical, um, more well thought out, which is good because it saves you a ton of time and you kind of just get straight to it, get what you need to do and get it done versus spending 12 hours in a studio and coming out with a song not finished. And here it's just like, let's get it done, let's get it going. And then in Asia, it's, it's a little different because Asia, A, there's a language barrier with most countries and B, there's also, it's a very different sound that is popular over there. So trying to get somebody to switch their mindset from pop music in Asia to pop music from Australia or pop music from Canada is very different. And so half of the battle is just trying to figure out, okay, I like elements of this, but I don't want it to sound too K-pop or J-pop or anything like that. So it's just kind of a back and forth in terms of, um, music production over in Asia. Yeah. Well, are you able to like articulate like what's an example of a, of, of like a difference between like Asia and, and Canada? In terms of the music? Yeah. Yeah. 
I think, um, well, the most famous band, I think BTS or oh, Blackpink, right. someone like yep. that, like very, um, I, I love that kind of music. I think it's amazing, but it's, it's extremely stylized and extremely well produced, but almost too produced for my kind of music coming from Australia, where we grew up with guitars on a beach. It's almost too polished. Um, and it's, it's so amazing the work that they do, but it's not the sound that I'm looking for. I want something a little bit more organic with the electronic in there as well. Wow. Yep. That makes sense. I like what you brought up about the, the sort of methodology and, and, um, Australia and how they do it. Cause I, I, I mean, it's the same here in the States. I feel like, I mean, it depends on the, on the genre, I think, but for here, it's very, um, like you said, methodical, it's very almost like technical, like, especially yeah. like everyone, a lot of people, instead of even, um, playing instruments now are just, you know, drawing, drawing them in and, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but to me, there is somewhat of a, there can be a missing element when you do, mm -hmm. when you do have like an instrument in your hand. And I even like, really like the idea of like switching instruments. Cause you know, you can have a, um, a frame of reference of what you think might sounds good with something you're used to playing all the time. But if you try something yeah. else, I don't know. Something else might pop into your head or something Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. I, I find when I, piano being my first instrument, I find whenever I write on the piano, I write more technically difficult songs to play and to produce. Um, but when I write on guitar, it's more simplistic because my skills are so simple and I, I wouldn't call myself a guitar player by any means, but it's just a means to play and get the song out of there. But what does come out of it is more a pop-based happy song, whereas whatever I play on piano, it's super sad, super melancholic. And it, I love it, but it's, you know, all these minor chords and these crazy chords that go in there. Um, and I think just changing the instruments and switching around really, really helps just switch your brain to be like, oh, this is something completely different. I can do whatever I want. There's no rules set to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you, are there anything, any like practices or things that you do outside of the conventional, you know, like just get better at making music that you feel kind of help you, um, in the writing process. Oh, very, very, question. very, very open-ended. <laughs> <Very. laughs> oh my gosh. I think, um, I mean, not, not really so much, but when I'm really struggling with a song, I will just pack it away for, an unlimited amount of time. And I don't mm -hmm. set myself a time limit. I, I know sometimes it's really hard. There's songs that I've absolutely adored and I love everything about them, but they're just not hitting where they need to hit. And I'm like, that's okay. I have to pack it away. And I'll, I think in my head, I'm going to come back to it in a week and then a year passes. But when I come back to it, it's the right time. So even yeah. if it's a year, two years, one of the songs on my album is 10 years old and I'm coming back to it now. And there's a lot I'm changing about it, but I'm like, this is what I needed. I think I needed the 10 year break from this song to get it to where it needs to be. Wow. I, I remember you telling me that. What, 10 years? I mean, that has yeah. to, but that, <laughs> <laughs> that's got to sound like totally different. Cause you talked about earlier, styles changed so much over that. Yes. Like, and skills as well. I think I've skills. learned so many more skills in that time frame. but I think that's what I needed. Maybe that's the missing link was the skill set, not knowing how to make things sound the way I wanted to. So I just had to leave the song and then come back to it. Yeah, definitely. So what, what with that song resonated with you to bring it back? I think, um, I, I, I don't know if you have the big folder of music, just folders and folders of different songs. I do on my I just computer, them, yeah. Yeah, I just have them all in web format and I just click and I play through all of them and I'll just set a day aside to listen to every single one. And then I put little, I'm very German in this sense, I put little like green markers next to the ones that are good to go and like little yellow markers of like, oh, this could be a maybe and then red to just leave alone. And this was one of the ones that came up and it kept getting a green mark every time. And I was like, there's something about it that keeps calling me back to this one song. So mm -hmm. I have to do it, get it out of my system and put yeah, it out there. Absolutely. That's cool. Uh, so speaking of this album, is there a date? Is that not yet? Uh, <laughs> is that not yet public knowledge? <laughs> it's, it 
it's definitely public knowledge because I think on my Instagram at least once a week, I'm like, Hey guys, it's coming at some point. I know I've been saying this for about six months right. now, but it's coming. It's getting closer. I think we're maybe three songs away from it being sent to be mixed and mastered. So I want to say in the next couple of months, don't hold me to this. Okay. All right. So <laughs> tentat- <then>. tentatively <laughs> yeah. in the next couple of months. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, where can people find you? Oh, they can find me everywhere. Um, all of the streaming services like iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube Music, all of those kind of things. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, all the social media. I'm pretty much everywhere. Yeah, great. Um, and then I had one last question for you. So if you had advice for someone who kind of dabbles in music, but they want to take it more seriously, do you have any advice on where they should start? Yeah, I think everyone should take music seriously and do it for fun as well. Um, you, you don't need to go 110% in to be 110% in. I have another job, you know, I'm still modeling. I still do other work on the side that supports this career. Um, but this is my thing that I love and this is my passion. And I think anybody can do it. To begin with, just get yourself some lessons. It's not that hard. You can get some cheap online lessons for vocals or playing instruments or for your door or whatever you need. I mean, our monthly course that we did just shows how good that course was. We learned so much um, and it was just a month. You know, you don't need to commit an entire four years of learning. You can just do a month and take it month by month. And I think really online these days, there's so many options for learning that you just, the world is your oyster for music. Sweet. Um, and actually you brought up something interesting that I meant to bring up earlier. So you do other, uh, so you do other work aside from the, okay. Um, how, how do you set aside time for, uh, music or or do you are you working full time with something or is it all like part-time and you just kind of have set aside time for music? So my work is, uh, it's part-time, it's casual actually. So it's kind of all over the place. So some weeks I'll be working 12 hour days every day for the next two weeks. And then some days I'll be just not working at all. And I think for me, I just take every opportunity where I'm not working to work on my music. So it's kind of that give and take. Um, If I'm really, really busy, there's a week that goes by where I don't touch music at all. But then I think you come back more refreshed, even if you're tired, you come back more refreshed to do that music. Um, I think when I was doing, I've never really had a nine to five with modeling. It hasn't been a thing, but I think when I was doing more regular modeling work and it was, you know, kind of 6 AM till 7 PM, I would come home and set aside an hour just to practice or an hour just to write down some notes and don't put pressure on yourself as well. I think that's something really important to remember. It's not, yes, this is still a job and it can be a career, but it doesn't need to be a pressure filled thing where you're beating yourself up because you're not doing the hundred hours or you're not being Ed Sheeran and busking every second of every day. You know, it's supposed to be fun as well. I I love that. Yep. Yep. Especially when you're looking at all the successful people out there, it's like, why can't I be like that? And it's just kind of, it's like self-defeating. So I like that. Yeah. Have fun with the process. (laughs) Yeah. And I think the success and happiness. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. This has been awesome. Thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah. And for those of you who have not done so already, definitely check out Isla Noir's music. And I believe you have a YouTube channel too. So subscribe to that. And uh, until next time, I'll see you in the next episode of Off the Dog.